This is the American Empire Element 2 about the Spanish-American War of 1898 that had actually originated in the Cuban Revolution against Spain of 1895. And as you can see from the slide here, it is something that the Cubans had been attempting for some time. Now, how does the Cuban Revolution of 1895 get started in the first place? Well, it's very similar to the story in Hawaii in the 1890s. Uh, sugar production in Cuba gets crippled by an American tariff in 1894. Now, it's not the McKinley Tariff of 1890, but it's a different tariff. And when that tariff in 1894 happened, Cuban insurrectos, or those who participate in an insurrection or a revolt, uh, that had been going on in Cuba for quite some time, like I had said before. The insurrectos begin a scorched earth policy on the cane fields and the sugar plantations. They basically just start burning everything down to the ground. They were hoping to drive out the Spanish sugar plantation owners. Now, the Cubans were kind of hoping for some help from us, and we sympathized with the Cubans. U.S. businesses had invested about $50 million in Cuba and benefited from about $100 million in trade with Cuba. Also, we wanted to maintain a good relationship with Cuba, because whoever controlled them controlled the Gulf of Mexico and Panama, where there were discussions about an eventual canal going in that we could possibly control. So it was all linked together, and we really wanted to keep Cuba happy if we could. But even though we were getting a little bit more involved in foreign affairs in the 1890s, we didn't really see the need to get involved in Cuba yet until 1896, when this guy was brought in to rule Cuba as governor. His name was Valeriano Weiler, and he was a Spanish general known as the Butcher. Weiler earned his nickname pretty well. Uh, he put many Cubans into barbed wire concentration camps, does that sound like somebody else you know, with no real sanitation, but it was actually a lot worse than that. Reports of the deaths that were taking place in Cuba under his hand were becoming widespread, and actual photographs like this one here of lynchings that were taking place in Cuba under Weiler's rule, as well as people being tied to trees and tortured, those photographs were making their way into the hands of Americans, and it was really starting to stir up our conscience. Although Adolf Hitler would have been only seven years old in 1896, Weiler was already acting like a foreshadowed version of him, uh, putting Cubans into these barbed wire concentration camps, no sanitation, and hundreds of deaths. There's a pile of skulls that were attributed to Weiler found in Cuba later on. So our conscience, like I said, is getting stirred up, and we were eventually going to get driven to the point of war with Spain. There were a lot of factors that went into that. The first one was yellow journalism, which was a, a new brand of sensationalism that was started by uh, a couple of guys. William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Yes, that Pulitzer. You know, the award for outstanding journalism? Yeah, it's named after this guy. He and Hearst were each trying to outdo each other for circulation with sensational headlines and stories that bordered on paranoia. But it seemed to work out for him. This is the castle that Hearst built about 100 miles south of San Francisco, California, where his newspaper was located, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. I actually passed it when I went up Pacific Coast Highway one time. And Pulitzer, like I said, got the highest award you can get in journalism named after him and this cool statue, so I guess it worked out okay for both of them, like I said. But that didn't change the fact that sometimes they just made stuff up to stir up the public. When stories about atrocities didn't really exist, often they were invented. This story about the Spaniards searching women on American steamers and stripping them down, that never took place. But it certainly riled up the American public. And then the situation becomes even worse because of this simple personal letter here. It was called the DeLome Letter, written from the Spanish minister in Washington, and it completely disrespected William McKinley. As you see down near the bottom here, it says, McKinley is weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd, besides being a would-be politician who tries to leave a door open behind himself while keeping on good terms with the jingos of his party. The jingos are the people who wanted war. Okay, so this thing is now spiraling out of control. And so the USS Maine, right here in the picture, is sent to Cuba in 1898 to protect 
uh, Americans who were down there and evacuate them if needed. Well, strangely enough, the main exploded in Havana Harbor on February 15, 1898, killing 260 Americans. Some said it was an accident. Some said it was intentional, done by the Spanish. Some even suggested that the Cubans were doing it, trying to get us mad and get us involved in the war on their side. We didn't get an answer until 1976. Spontaneous combustion in a coal bunker caused the explosion of the main. But that wouldn't have mattered anyway because a lot of the American public, and especially the yellow journalists, had a very jingoistic or war-crazy mood. Now, the problem was is that the U.S. had already gotten their demands on what was going on down there. Weiler had ended the camps and made peace with the insurrectos, but it was too late. Between the yellow journalism and the explosion of the Maine, the Americans wanted war, and they were probably going to get it. Their rallying cry turned into, Remember the Maine to hell with Spain. Also, many in America knew that the Spanish were a declining empire at this point, who was probably going to have a hard time holding on to their possessions. They didn't have the navy and the military that they used to have. This could be a very easy time to get some easy colonial territory from them. Now, McKinley didn't want a war, but he did want Spain out of Cuba, or did he? If Spain left Cuba, would the Cubans want to be independent? Uh, McKinley didn't want that either. He wanted the U.S. to be able to influence them. So it was a pretty bad spot for McKinley to be in. And frankly, the Americans were tired of his waffling on the issue. They started referring to him as Wobbly Willie and started hanging him in effigy for his indecision, often criticized by war-hungry Teddy Roosevelt so much and becoming so stressed about it that he needed sleeping pills. Eventually, he kind of caved in because Congress was threatening a revolt against him, essentially, and war was declared on April 11th, 1898. But McKinley added one thing to the war declaration that made him feel a little bit better. Congress passed the Teller Amendment, claiming that the U.S. would ensure Cuban independence after the war. You're going to want to remember that. Okay, so here we go, the Spanish-American War of 1898. And as you can see from the chart here, it's clearly a war with Spain, Ships coming from Spain to the Caribbean to fight in Cuba against the United States. So it's only natural that the war for Cuba should start in the Philippines? Way over here? It's the Spanish-American War, which started in Cuba. So... Why is it being fought in its first battle way over here? I mean, the Philippines are even farther away when you look at them on this map. So, whose crazy idea was this, anyway? Well, it wasn't President McKinley's. This order happened one and a half months before war was even declared, and McKinley made it clear that he didn't even want a war in the first place. And it wasn't the Secretary of the Navy, John Long. He was out of the office when the order was given. So his hot-tempered assistant Secretary of the Navy cabled Commodore George Dewey in Hong Kong and ordered an attack on the Philippines one and a half months before war was declared. By the time Long had returned to the office, neither he nor McKinley could stop the ball from rolling due to public opinion. Everybody wanted to go to war, it seemed. And what was this hot-tempered assistant secretary of the Navy's name? The guy who declared or actually ordered an invasion of the Philippines a month and a half before war was declared? Theodore Roosevelt. And if you remember anything we've studied about him so far, this makes all the sense in the world. And so, on May 1st, Commodore George Dewey sailed six ships into Manila Harbor in the Philippines and destroyed the 10-ship Spanish fleet that was already stationed there without one U.S. casualty. Overnight, he became a national hero. However, Dewey couldn't attack forts with sailors, so while the Spanish were still there in their forts shooting at him, Dewey had to sweat it out waiting for three months in Manila Harbor for U.S. troops to arrive behind him. Now, had he not been ordered to go in there a month and a half before war was declared... 
he might have gotten a little sooner uh, help. But he held out there for three months waiting for troops to arrive, and uh, eventually they did. And once those troops arrived, they were finally able to take Manila in August with the help of Filipino rebels led by Emilio Aguinaldo, who was brought out of exile in Asia. This guy led the Philippine revolt against the Spanish, fighting, and this is key to remember, fighting alongside the United States. Okay, so here's what we know so far. Teddy Roosevelt ordered George Dewey 90 days ahead of the declaration of war into Manila to knock the Spanish out in the Philippines. And after sitting there for three months, troops arrived to help out Dewey, as well as uh, Emilio Aguinaldo and the Philippine rebels, to drive the Spanish out of the Philippines. Job basically done there. So let's go back over here to the Cuban side for a second here. Now, the Spanish had sailed a fleet of warships into Cuba. Spurned on by yellow journalism and sensationalism and paranoia in the United States, the east coast of the United States completely panicked. But U.S. warships easily trapped the Spanish fleet in Santiago Harbor, uh, right here. Now, the U.S. Army attacked the harbor from land. Now, the U.S. military was led by this guy right here in the boat, William Shafter. Uh, his troops had been given heavy wool clothing to fight a war in Cuba. It wasn't the most organized operation. And it also didn't help that uh, Shafter himself was ridiculously overweight, so much so that he often had to be carried around on a door while they were down there. Uh, once again, uh, the American detachment down there was not the most organized thing. Now, into this mix, you also have to throw in a group that really has never been seen in any other kind of war. They're very unique, and they're simply known as the Rough Riders. Now, the Rough Riders were a volunteer regiment led by Colonel Leonard Wood, and they basically just decided to step in and aid the U.S. military, whether the military wanted them there or not. They consisted of cowboys, tough guys, ex-athletes, and some ex-convicts, as well as this guy right here, Theodore Roosevelt, who, after sending Dewey into Manila Harbor, quit his job as Assistant Secretary of the Navy to form the Rough Riders and name himself a Lieutenant Colonel. Roosevelt was so excited about finally being able to go to war that he went to Brooks Brothers, the premier men's clothier of the time, sat down, did a bunch of sketches, and ordered a series of different uniforms that he could wear in the war. He, he was also so nearsighted that he bought 12 extra pairs of spectacles to take with him on the trip. So he was all about the glory. This was a big, big party for him. By the way, he was the only one who had all the extra sets of uniforms, too. Now, as you can see in this slide here, the whole operation, once again, wasn't the most organized thing. In June of 1898, 17,000 U.S. troops, again completely disorganized, met in Tampa uh, to get ready to deploy to Cuba to fight in this war. And a month later, by July, the Rough Riders uh, saw a significant amount of action, helping out the U.S. military. They charged a hill and met heavy casualties, but Teddy Roosevelt, having the time of his life, got to shoot a Spanish soldier and wrote about his exploits in a book after the war. As you can imagine, he described every detail and was extremely proud of himself uh, for the adventure that he was living. But the war soon comes to a close when the U.S. military charges San Juan Hill and drives the Spanish out of Santiago Harbor, right into the teeth of the waiting U.S. Navy. And with that, the Spanish-American War came to a close in August. It was a very short war. Now, as I said in Element 1, in July, the U.S. annexed Hawaii. They were worried that Japan was going to grab it while America was distracted with the Spanish-American War, and the U.S. wanted it as a naval base. This also satisfied the economic reasons that we expressed in the first element about the uh, you know markets and the pineapple farming and things like that. So that's basically it. The splendid little war, the Spanish-American War, done short, sweet, and quick. That's all. Thanks for listening.